COVID-19 and the related financial crisis, we are at risk of cutting our research budget by 50% this year. The goal of this call is to share why we can't let this happen. Anthony Marino, our EVP in the Northeast, will kick us off. Good morning, Anthony. Hey, good morning, Dara, and good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for, for being on the call with us this morning. Um, Obviously for us, we thought it was important to bring everyone together to talk about the research challenge that is ahead of us. Um, obviously, we've got some great speakers on the line with us today, really to talk about what is ahead of us as we look at this research crisis facing the American Cancer Society here in 2020. Um, we've launched a $100 million national campaign that we refer to as Cancer Research Funding Challenge, and that's exactly what this is. It's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge that we're strong enough to get through, but honestly, as we go through all of this, it's going to take all of us to be involved to be successful. So as we be a part of this, right, it's a hundred million dollar challenge for the American Cancer Society, but here in the Northeast, we've accepted a $20 million goal as part of this going forward. So in the next half hour, you're going to hear from a number of speakers. Um, two cancer survivors who I'm proud to call teammates of ours here in the Northeast region, Dr. Aggie Belska, an ACS funded researcher from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and our research campion, campaign leaders, Dr. Arnie Bastis and Dr. Mark Goldberg. So in an effort to keep this brief, um, really we do wanna keep this to a half an hour call, right? So you can feel free to reach out to me at any time with any questions that you may have, your ACS staff partner, and we'll be doing some follow up with you as well. But really at this time, I'm honored to introduce our first speaker, um, Rachel Fournier. She's the Director of Foundation Relations on our philanthropy team here. She lives in South Jersey with her husband and her two teenagers. And I really thought it was important for you all to hear from Rachel this morning. Hi, good morning everyone. And thank you, Anthony. Um, I was diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer um, at the age of 38 in August of 2015. And um, metastatic breast cancer or stage four breast cancer um, is, is incurable. Um, so if I, I think back to how my life has changed uh, since then. So in the spring of 2015, you know, I had two young children. They were eight and 10. Um, you know, I was married to the boy I met at summer camp. I was three weeks into a brand new job. You know, I was living this great life. And we had gone on vacation and gone jet skiing. And I had this really nagging back pain um, that became throughout the course of the summer more and more debilitating um, to the point that, you know, over the course of that time, I had gone to primary care and they kind of brushed it off as, you know, you're almost 40, of course you have back pain. And, um, you know, I had no family history of cancer. I had, um, I had no screening mammogram because I was under 40. And so, um, I finally got an MRI and it turned out I had spinal fractures um, in three places. And I thought, well, that's really inconvenient, but you know, I'll, I'll get surgery and I'll be fine. And um, I went to see the orthopedic surgeon and he said, you actually have cancer in at least 40 bones throughout your body. And um, you know, because of your age, it likely is metastatic breast cancer. And so I went home, I immediately went on cancer.org and I saw that um, metastatic breast cancer has a five year survival rate of 28%, um, which is a really nice way of saying that you have a five year um, likelihood of not surviving of 72%. So, you know, absolute devastation, all of the things that come along with a, you know, a, a terminal cancer diagnosis. And so life stopped, um, I, I could no longer look in my kids' faces because I, I knew their mother was about to destroy everything about their life. And um, I went to my first oncology treatment, was absolutely terrified. And my oncologist wrote down, here are the available treatments for you. You're going to be on treatment forever. And we're going to string together as many as we can to give you as much time as possible. And it's a really short, finite list. And, you know, I was so focused on everything I was about to lose and how my family was about to be destroyed. And I feel like time just sort of stood in the balance and there was silence. And, and then she said, 
But while you're in treatment and while you're going through all of these treatments um, that are on this list, there are researchers in labs, there are patients in clinical trials, there are FDA approvals going on. And our objective is that while you're progressing, we are adding to this list and we're building this toolkit so that you will not run out of options. So that when you're at the end of this list, we've created a new list. And that suddenly created so much hope for me. Um, and it allowed me to live what has been, by most accounts, a, a relatively normal life over the last five years. Um, I've seen my daughter start high school. I've seen my son hit his first home run. I've, you know, been there for them every day after school. And, you know, I, I receive um, scans every 12 weeks to see if treatment is still working. And, you know, I'm, I'm currently... Um, I'm currently on my third line treatment and, and that's in five years, that's actually a pretty lucky record. And so whenever I go to treatment, you know, where I'm treated, I, I look up sort of the research tower and I know the investigators are in there and I kind of send my good wishes and, you know, really hope that, you know, that we can continue to really push that 28% survival rate up little by little. And so, um, Basically, I, I'm doing well enough that the cancer is stable enough and treatment is tolerable enough that I really started to think, you know, maybe I can dare to dream of a future and what do I want that future to look like? And, and for me, what I want that future to look like is for other cancer patients like me to be able to dream of a future. And so I really wanted to give back and I really wanted to get involved in, in funding research and it's the very research that will um, preserve my life. And so I joined ACS in February of 2020. And 2020 um, at the outset was not a terrible time to be a cancer patient. I might say it was the best time ever to be a cancer patient. We have the Affordable Care Act, um, immunotherapy um, is, is finding breakthroughs and there are new drugs on the horizon. And then COVID happened. Um, and so suddenly, you know, the story internally, the story externally started to shift into you know, we may have to put research on pause. We may not be able to fund research. And that sounds like a temporary issue. Um, but for me, what that means is that my list will no longer grow. And so, um, like I said, I'm currently on my third line treatment. Um, the way that drug development works is that the trajectory is incredibly long. So, that drug that I'm currently on is based in research from 1985. I mean, and I was nine and it was approved in February of last year. Um, the next drug on my list was FDA approved in February of this year. So, you know, I am incredibly grateful to the American Cancer Society and the leadership of all of you because you truly are what have given me the past five years. Um, but I need to be able to look in the face of my children and tell them that I have done everything in my power to save their mother. And for the first time, I'm really terrified that I am going to run out of options and I need all of your help um, to be able to know that that list is going to continue to grow. And that's true for me, that's true for all cancer patients. And if we're going to continue to nudge survival rates, uh, research is really the only way that we're going to be able to do that. So thank you. Um, I'm available and you know happy to share my story wherever you think um, it might have an impact. Rachel, thank you. You're you're amazing and you tell your story so beautifully. So just thank you for sharing with all of us today. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Agata Bielska. Aggie is currently funded um, at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, she's an ACS funded researcher. She is studying cancer progression and metastasis. Thank you so much for joining us today, Aggie. Thank you, Dara. And thank you, Rachel, for that really inspiring um, story. You know, I'm a young doctor, just starting my practicing, a young researcher, and it's really trying, you know, it's people like you who are inspiring me to kind of continue this research and move the ball forward. Um, and I'd really like to tell everyone a little bit about what I'm researching now, which is the, this ACS-funded project. Um, and it's to better understand this um, growth of cells, how cells are trying to grow and divide, and how this process is very commonly co-opted by cancers. 
But the central regulator of this growth process is this protein called mTOR. So it gets input from outside the cell called growth factors. Those growth factors come in through uh, receptors. So those receptors are actually very commonly mutated in cancers, like HER2 is one of those. Um, that signal comes in and ultimately activates mTOR. Um, PI3 kinase is another part of that arm that's very commonly mutated. But very interestingly, sort of the paradox is that mTOR itself, despite it being this major regulator of growth in cells, is very rarely mutated. So when you actually look through human cancers, it's mutated in about one to three percent of those cancers. And so I wanted to try to understand, you know, why could that be? Um, and what mTOR also does is it integrates the signals that the cell has for what nutrients are available to actually grow. So it gets these signals from the outside, these growth factors, but it also assesses, you know, do I have enough, um, you know, sugar? Do I have enough amino acids to actually grow and divide? And um, when I actually look at where mTOR is mutated, it turns out it's in these it, renal cell carcinomas are the most common and other cancers that are hypervascular. And to me that says, okay, so they don't have any interruption in their nutrient supply, but maybe under nutrient stress, these types of mutations would be detrimental. And indeed that's what we're finding. So when I take these cells that have mutations in mTOR, and I put them in sort of normal conditions where they have all of the nutrients they need, then they grow very well. They grow faster than the regular cells. But when I deprive them of any nutrients like glucose or amino acids, then they start to have trouble and they actually do much worse and they start to die. And so to us, that's very interesting uh, as a target. So although this is a rare mutation, there are still one to 3% of people who have mTOR mutations and you know, we're trying to understand, can we target this nutrient vulnerability in these cancers? And then also sort of as a bigger picture to try to understand, you know, we can see that one arm of this pathway is very commonly mutated. So the receptor tyrosine kinases and PI3 kinases, but this nutrient sensing arm of the pathway is very um, uncommonly mutated. And can we take advantage of that, of that sort of in, in the bigger picture of other types of cancers, even without mTOR mutations? So that's really what I'm interested in, and I feel so privileged to be an ACS-funded researcher, especially now as a young doctor, really getting on my feet um, to do this research and also to see patients. I mean, this funding has been so necessary for me to be able to continue to do what I'm doing, um, and I feel privileged to be a part of this mission. Thank you so much, Aggie. I'm so impressed. Um, and we all really look forward to following your work. Um, and next, I would like to introduce our friend, Dr. Arnie Baskies. Arnie? Hi there, everybody. Um, first of all, let me tell, uh, thank all of you for getting up at a, a relatively early hour um, to listen to what we have to say. Um, it's kind of interesting that um, Rachel has talked about what a difference research has made in her life. Uh, I've been at this business of cancer treatment since 1975, when I graduated medical school in the dark ages of medicine. And I will tell you that in 1975, breast cancer, patients with breast cancer had a survival rate of 75%, which means that 25% of women who were diagnosed in 1975 we're going to live five years and 25% would probably be dead in five years. And that isn't just patients with metastatic disease. Uh, at that time, patients who had even a cancer that was the th size of my thumbnail, think about that. 20% of them would re have a recurrence rate, what would recur within five years, not necessarily uh, succumb to the disease, but would have a recurrence of the disease. Um, right now, as we speak, it's probably the survival rate for breast cancer is about 93% overall. So we've gone from 75 to 93%. And that's not by accident. That's because of the fact that the, that the American Cancer Society and your federal government have invested millions of dollars in trying to get treatments out there to, and to prevent the disease in patients who have high risk. That would not have happened had it not been for the American Cancer Society, all right? 
the work that Aggie's doing is very, very interesting and wouldn't be possible unless we supported that research. So we've we've come full circle. We have Rachel, who's the beneficiary of that. And we have Aggie, who is also a beneficiary, but is out there helping patients like Rachel every day of the week. It's clear that we're living in an era when the need for science, sound science, has never been uh, greater. For over a century, think about that, for over 100 years, well over 100 years, the American Cancer Society has really been at the forefront of cancer research. This is, the society is the organization that actually jump-started cancer research in this country, um, all because of the work of a philanthropist by the name of Mary Lasker, uh, who 80 years ago uh, set an ambitious goal of raising $1 million and used all the influence that was available to her, mainly political influence, by the way, to get the president and the, Ameri and the American public on her side. So that's really what we're here. That's really why we're we're talking to one another this morning. As leaders of this society, we know that you have enormous influence. And without being an alarmist, which some people have uh, have said that I am, we want to bring you up to date on what's at stake uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And by the way, I'm glad that you had Aggie on because it's nice to find out that there are people that are actually doing research in something other than COVID. <laughs> Uh, it's uh, unbelievable what's going on. I mean, if you listen to the news, uh, as I do and you do every day, the only news that we hear about from a science perspective is COVID. In fact, all of the pharma um, um, newsletters that I get, and I'm on the board of four companies, uh, is replete with what's happening with COVID every single day of the week. So the COVID-19 pandemic, in case you didn't hear about it, has caused a lot of interruptions in research in general. There was a study published at Yale. Listen to this, this is an amazing study. Uh, this was in April, okay? Uh, there was a study published from Yale uh, and the study showed that over 200,000, over 200,000 research projects had been delayed or stopped or discontinued because of COVID in April. You can only imagine how many more research projects have been, have been halted because of COVID. It's unbelievable. And we're talking about something that's only six months, eight months old. We also know that early detection saves lives and over 80,000 cancer screenings, including mammograms and colonoscopies have been delayed. And by the way, the AACR, the American Association of Cancer Research, did a study looking at what happened to patients who were being treated for cancer. And guess what? 79%, almost 80% of the patients in that study had their cancer treatments halted or delayed. That makes a difference. And we're going to see that difference probably in the next couple of years as it, as it translates down the line between people not being able to get to see their doctor because we've changed the way we see patients now. Nobody goes to a waiting room. You got to wait in the, you got to wait outside in a car as many of you know, before you get into the doctor's office, right? That's what happens. And so you can't see as many patients in the course of a day as you could before. That's, that's a, nobody's even talking about that. But these are the things that have devastated not only the research end of things, but the treatment end of things. The fact is, uh, the American Cancer Society may, be, may only be able to fund, because of all of the things that have happened to our fundraising mechanisms, um, may only be able to fund half of the research that we have funded in previous years. There are brilliant minds like Aggie who are out there who want to pursue cancer research and won't get the opportunity. Um, and they will take careers in, in different directions. Uh, I, I would say to you, not on our watch. We really can't allow that to happen. All right. Early when I, when I was an investigator and doing a lot of research, I worked with Tony Fauci. He was upstairs from me, one floor. I was on the 10th floor of building 10 at the NC uh, at the NIH. Uh, that was where the uh, surgical uh, oncology uh, research stuff was being done. And Tony was on the 11th floor. Um, and I spent time in his lab and uh, we were both studying the immune system. He was studying it from the perspective of people who had immunodeficiency diseases due to AIDS. He didn't, we didn't know what AIDS was by the way in 1977, but we came to find out 
All he knew was that he was studying a group of people who immunologically were deficient and were mainly uh, the, from the gay population in New York City. That was where the outbreak occurred, started, uh, and we came to find out that was AIDS. I was studying immunodeficiency because we were giving people chemotherapy that was knocking out their immune system. So we worked together, and what we found was that we needed that investment in research. Um, without the money that was going, without, without the money that was going to the NCI um, at the time, we wouldn't have been able to do the things that we've been able to do. And by the way, all of the checkpoint inhibitor work, all the stuff that's being done in melanoma, uh, which has kept Jimmy Carter alive for the last five years or so, because he had metastatic melanoma, all of that research is based on what was done ten years ago, over ten years ago. So. What's being done now, uh, as Rachel said, uh, at this very moment at the bench in, in a laboratory takes at least 10 years to get to the bedside. If we interrupt what's being done this year, we can wipe out a whole decade of cancer research. Isn't that a tragedy? Wouldn't that be a tragedy if that happens? So we've come too far to lose a generation of progress. Um, I, I don't want that to happen, nor do you. That's why you're on this phone call at eight o'clock. That's why I'm asking you to use all the influence and resources in your command and to, and to ask the people on your boards to do the same, to look at every nook and cranny, every person that they know who can come up with some dollars, no matter how small or how large it is, we need it. Um, and so we can fund the research projects, um, not only for, at the bench, but also in health equity and disparities, which is also a huge uh, dilemma that we have. We know that people of color have a lower chance of surviving cancer uh, than other people in our population. And that's something that we can't allow to continue. So we've come too far to see that progress put on pause. Please do everything in your power everything in your power to see that we can make the commit can fund the commitments that we've made to research and i will stop talking now thank you thank you so much dr baskies um i'm going to start bringing you on um calls with me to uh ask people for money because um, i'm ready to give more um next we have dr mark goldberg who is also a great friend of ours um he is leading the challenge um, of this research campaign from a national level. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mark. Uh, good morning. Thank you for having me. Um, I, I'm a hematologist oncologist by training. Uh, I've been on the faculty at Brigham and Women's Hospital, uh, Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School for my entire career. I've also been in, in the biotech industry and research and development uh, for the past quarter of a century. And I, I'm also a member of the National Board of the American Cancer Society. And like many of you, I have my own personal cancer story. When the worst day of my life was December 22nd, 1963, I was nine years old and my 36 year old non-smoking mother uh, died of uh, metastatic lung cancer, leaving me, my, my six year old brother and four year old sister uh, and my father to care for us. Uh, at that time, we knew next to nothing about the causes of cancer. In fact, people didn't even use, they didn't speak about cancer. They may say, might say the big C. They didn't allow uh, my, my brother and sister and I to visit my mother in the hospital. And, and the supports for patients uh, were, were pretty minimal. And, and again, the, the research was in its infancy. Very, very little was understood. Since then, we've come a long, long way. and. I think it's fair to say that the American Cancer Society has played a critical role in almost every aspect of these advances. And I, I'm very proud of the fact uh, of our slogan that we attack the American Cancer Society, we attack cancer from every angle. The educational services we provide, the advocacy that we, we do on behalf of cancer patients and their family families, this the services and supports, the transportation, the lodging. Uh, have been critically important. Our role as a partner, as a collaborator, and as a convener has been, have been critical. And very importantly, our sponsorship of research has also been critical, and you've heard about that a bit already. 
And we're facing a crisis like no other. And let me just give you a, a little bit more information. You've heard a lot already. But since we started investing in cancer research at the American Cancer Society, we've invested almost $5 billion. We've, now, there are other groups that invest in cancer research, the National Cancer Institute, private industry. But one of the things that we've done and we've been incredibly successful at is about one third of all young cancer researchers have been funded by the American Cancer Society in the United States. One third. If we don't fund those people, who will? And as as Dr. Baskey says, where will they go? Their careers may go in other directions, uh, and we may lose some of the great innovations that you've already that are the next generation of, of new advances. And we at the American Cancer Society have been extremely successful in choosing the right people to invest in. And we invest, we take the best and the brightest from around the country. Right now we're investing uh, in research in over 200 institutions. And the, one of the keys to our success has been an extremely strong peer review process that has allowed us to pick those best and brightest early in their careers. And proof of that success is that 49 people who we invested in earlier in their careers have gone on to win the Nobel Prize, including two this past year, uh, Greg Semenza at Johns Hopkins and, and a good friend and colleague of mine, Bill Kalin at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Importantly, our research uh, program and our support is not just for basic and, and critical research in that area, but also we've been uh, invested in health equity and trying to alleviate and remove disparities for a long, long time. And about, about 60 health equity grants are being funded uh, this year. Now, with the COVID-19, our, our funding at ACS has gone from a, a projection of about 700 million down to about 500 million. That's led to about a 30% reduction in our workforce. Many of, of the remaining staff, including perhaps all of those on this call, have taken significant pay cuts, even though they're working harder than ever. Uh, and our program, our research program, is facing a crisis like never before. This past month, I believe for the first time in our history, we've decided not to accept applications for the fall submission cycle to look at new grants because we don't we will not fund we will not anything that we say we'll fund we are committed to and we will not renege on that and so we're really losing a tremendous amount if we can't fund our research program so that's the purpose of this research campaign. We have a very ambitious and bold goal, goal to raise $100 million. We've already raised about $37 million. We have about $63 million to go. Um, and when we go to foundations, to big corporations, to high net worth individuals, one of the first things that they ask is, well, what is your board what are your boards doing to support your program? And we need to be able to say to them that we have 100% particip participation from our boards. We also have, as part of this larger $100 million campaign, a $1 million board research challenge. And by that, I mean our goal is to raise an additional $1 million between our national board and our, and our 48 or so area boards. And so what we're asking of, of all of you is to, if you could please consider giving an additional meaningful gift this year and next um, on top of what you would normally be giving. Um, we, we're asking and we'll be following up your executive directors and your board chairs will be following up with each of you individually um, to talk with you and see if you could if you and we realize people are in, are in different places right now, but whatever is meaningful to you, we need a hundred percent participation, and we're asking for your help. In addition, and finally, if you in your think about your network, if there are those who are who have benefited from, who are in a position to give back, who care about continuing to advance cancer research, please put us in touch with them. Um, make those connections so that we can reach this uh, hundred million dollars. So thank you all for the, all you have done and all that you are doing. Uh, please stay well and stay strong. And 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 thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, that's just 
so you know that's what we need to be doing. Um, I know we're going a little bit over. If you could hang on, um, that would be great. We have um, a coworker, Leanne Ewart, who um, is a childhood cancer survivor, who will so eloquently share her story now. Thank you, Dara. And I promise to make this brief because I know everybody has a very busy day ahead. Um, as Dara said, I am a childhood cancer survivor. When I was 17 years old on my way to get my prom dress with my mom and my sister, I had, uh, my sister had said something to me and I turned around to give her a little playful jab um, in the car and I felt a huge lump in my neck. Um, you know, we didn't think anything of it. My mom said, your, your glands are swollen. You just had a cold, you're gonna be fine. Uh, fast forward a few weeks later and my 18th birthday, my uncle is a doctor and he had come over to celebrate. And my mom said, why don't you feel her neck, you know, really quick and just see what you think. Um, and at that moment he felt it and he knew that it was not good. Um, he didn't tell me that day. However, the next day, my aunt was on the phone saying we need to we need to go to the doctor. Um, 18 years old, I went to have surgery. I, I was diagnosed with Hodgkin's disease, which um, my oncologist told me I was very lucky to have because it's a very curable disease. But when you're 18 and your life is going to the prom and going to college, and everything is great. And the biggest stress that you have is, you know, are you gonna have the cutest prom dress? I don't wanna hear that this is the best cancer I could have. Um, I made it to the prom. My oncologist told me that I would look like Sinead O'Connor. For those of you who are old enough to remember Sinead O'Connor, um, you know, I was devastated. But, you know, what was I gonna do? We went to treatment, I had six months. I had to delay college. Um, I saved my hair for prom, despite that oncologist. I lost it the day after in the shower, clumps of hair fell out. Um, needless to say, it was devastating. It was the worst time in my life. Um, but I knew that it was a good chance that I would be okay. And that's what kept me going. Um, fast forward those six months later, I went to college. I kind of put the cancer diagnosis behind me. I continued with my follow-up appointments and um, I came home for the summer and somebody from the American Cancer Society called me and said, would you like to do Relay for Life? I had never heard of it. Why not? You know, it sounds fun. I camp out, walk with my friends, not a big deal. This is gonna be a good night. Um, that year it rained, I was exhausted I got in the car and I said, I'm never doing this again. The next day I woke up and I said, okay, this is how we're gonna make it better. This is what we're gonna do. Four years later, I'm still doing relay in college. Somebody from ACS calls and says, we have a job opening. Do you want it? Absolutely. What else can I do to make a difference in this world? Um, you know, I think I, I suffer a little bit from Catholic guilt and a little bit from survivor guilt that I'm here for a reason. So whatever I can do every single day to make life better for somebody who's diagnosed, especially anybody under the age of 18, I'm going to do it. So I took that job with ACS. You know, I was bright eyed, bushy tailed, ready to go um, because of my diagnosis years before. I didn't know if I was going to be able to have children. Um, lo and behold, I have a miracle baby. Her name is Olivia and I can't go to one of my relays staffing it. But I go as a survivor and just to hang out and say hi and show off my beautiful baby. And we get to the relay and it's time for the survivor lap. And those of you who participated in relay know that you stand around and you clap for all those survivors and you cheer. And they told me I needed to go out for the lap. And I said, no, this is not my thing. I'm here just you know, to have fun. I don't want any attention. And they said, you have to go out there. You are hope. You're holding that baby and you're showing everyone that this, this is what we're fighting for. And I got on that track and I, for the rest of my life, that moment will be the defining moment of my survivorhood, walking with my baby that I didn't think I could have. 
So that's why I'm here today. I am almost 40 and I'm proud of that. I've had so many more years to have this amazing life. And not only do I have one a miracle baby, I have another miracle baby who I just locked in her bedroom in her crib because she was being too loud. And now she's sleeping, so that's great. But this is why I'm here. This is why you're here. We all have that story. We all know somebody. I'm one of the lucky ones that my cancer was curable because of all the research done years before I was probably even born. And so that's why we're fighting every day. I know you know it, and I know you've done so much. So on behalf of every survivor out there, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I will continue to work every single day as a survivor, as a proud member of the ACS family, and I know that you will too. Thank you. Leanne, thank you so much for sharing that. And, you know, for everyone, again, thank you for being on the call this morning. Um, to Arnie and Mark, thank you for your leadership and in, in talking about this campaign and the work that we're doing um, for all of you on this call, right? You're all leaders within our communities and the work that we do. Um, Aggie, thank you for joining us and sharing your work. You know, I think here at the American Cancer Society, a lot of times we talk about the research that we have done but it's the research that's taking place right now. It's that research that is going to be taking place in the years ahead of us um, that is truly going to make that difference for us. Um, Leanne and Rachel, every time I hear you guys speak, I become a puddle. And I say that in the most positive way I possibly can because, you know, when we talk about this and, and when, I think of both of you, it's why we wanted to have this call and to share with our volunteers. We all know people that have been impacted. We all know people that have been touched, um, but your two stories, they just resonate with me so much. And I thought it was just important for everyone to hear that. So we have a mantra with our team. We say that we're gonna do whatever it takes. And you know, with that, it comes to engaging our board members and quite honestly, to making the ask. As Mark said, we need 100% participation. And I know we ask so much of all of you each and every day, and you stand by us through all these years, 2020 included. So from the bottom of my heart, I just wanted to say thank you. Um, your, your teammates, our staff members will be in touch with you about how you can get involved, what we can do. Um, but again, just I'll just close saying, Leanne and Rachel, thank you so much for sharing this morning. Um, your stories just, they, they mean much, so much to all of us. So just thank you so much. And again, thank you everyone for being a part of this. Have a great day. Thank you.